Girls Can Crate is a unique subscription box inspiring girls to believe that they can be and do anything. How do they do it? Like us, Girls Can Crate believes that real women make the best heroes. And every month they deliver them to your doorstep. Introducing the Every Podcast Series. Presented by UC Health, each episode tackles health and wellness issues and features female experts sharing insights to help you live your best life. Click here to listen and be well. This episode is also sponsored by our Patreon supporters, Kate Leon O'Neill, Monique Harris Pixado, Caitlin McTaggart, Lindsay Cummings, Mandy Booty, Jamie Lang, Maria Carla Sanchez, Chantel Oliver, Valerie Jacobson, Ellen Gross, Jill Harrigan, Heather McKinnon, and Craig Williamson. Want to travel with what's her name? We're taking our very first women's history tour to England this September. It's completely curated by Katie and I, and we will be your tour guides. You can come along, find all the info on our website at whatshernamepodcast.com, click tours, and come hang out with us in England this fall. Hi, Katie. Hi, Olivia. Hi, hi, hi. Season 11. Yes. Season 11. So exciting. I don't know about you, but I have got some good stuff this season. Me too. I'm so excited. Yep. So much good stuff. Sweet. Today, I'm very excited because today we are delving into one of my very favorite, very nerdiest (laughs) enthusiasms. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) are we doing opera? today. Yes, I was going to give you clues, but that was fast. (laughs) Well, you said very nerdiest thing you do. (laughs) There's a lot of those. (laughs) I know, but you know, who can forget opera scrapbook? Opera scrapbook. In high school. I mean, yeah. Nobody can match that as far as nerd is. Scale. I win all nerd showdowns. Yes. I don't absolutely. even have to explain. Just the title, Opera Scrapbook, yep. tends yep. to shut down competition. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're going to the opera. All right. We're going to dress in our finest garb and bring opera glasses. Of course. Box seats. We better have box seats. Of course. I mean, I've never have I've never sat in box seats in my life. <laughs> but today we shall. <laughs> and today we are heading to a place that I don't think we've ever traveled before on this podcast. Ooh. We're going to Ukraine. Ooh, we're going to the opera in Ukraine. Yes, I was not expecting that. (laughs) This whole story is full of things that you don't expect. I'm Olivia Mickle. And I'm Katie Nelson. And this is What's Her Name? Fascinating women you've never heard of. Another first for us. (laughs) Today we have our first ever second generation What's Her Name guest, Dr. Erica Glenn. Oh. And she is the daughter of Charlie Mullins Glenn, right. your guest. Yeah. Way back on episode three. Right, the bookmobile. My name is Erica Glenn, and I am just finishing up a doctoral program at Arizona State University in choral conducting. My background is also in the arts and education and composition, theory and composition, which is what my first two degrees are in. Erica Glenn is a brilliant conductor, performer. She is director of choral activities at BYU Hawaii, founder of the Arizona Women's Collective, and winner of a very long list of awards. Cool. And while we're going to Ukraine, like so many of these stories, this story begins with a graduate student in an archive Ah. searching for hints that women may have also existed prior to the 21st century. (laughs) It's a noble pursuit. I have for many, many years had this longtime interest in female composers and the stories of females that have been lost in the annals of history. And I was 
actually researching a Russian female composer, Ella Adeyevskaya. And I kept running into walls. I couldn't find, she never had any posterity. I couldn't make any meaningful connections. I was starting to get really frustrated. But I ran across this database where they had listed female composers from Slavic areas, from post-Soviet spaces. And I saw that there was one from Ukraine. And I had been focusing my research on Russia because I assumed there wasn't a lot in Ukraine. And Erica Glenn speaks both Russian and Ukrainian, oh. just, you know, as one does. Right. That's handy. So this was very exciting news for her. Mm. And through a remarkable series of lucky coincidences and determined sleuthing, Erica Glenn is about to uncover a treasure trove. I went sleuthing across the internet to try to find more details. And there was a brief English language Wikipedia article. And then that was it for the English language. That was literally it. And I followed some of the sources at the bottom of the Wikipedia article. And it took me to a Ukrainian language documentary. And that documentary had been posted to YouTube by a group called Photographs of Old Lviv. Lviv is a a city in Western Ukraine. So I managed to find them on Facebook and I just sent them a message. I think I sent my message in Russian. I said, I ran across the name of this woman. Do you have any information that you could give me about her? Immediately within probably 10 minutes, somebody had messaged me back and in English said, I am actually Stefania Turkevich's great nephew. I started digging into Stefania Turkevich's story and most of the efforts had been focused on unearthing her art songs, which are really beautiful, and she wrote a lot of them. There's an organization called the Ukrainian Art Song Project, which was founded by a man named Pavlo Hunka, and he's made a real push to uncover a lot of these lost voices in Ukrainian history. in the political history of Ukraine where these kinds of stories are not just interesting but actually vital. Ukraine is often seen as this buffer between Russia and the rest of Europe. And so unfortunately it kind of gets overlooked sometimes as its own entity with its own unique rich history. Ukraine has been subject to repression of its language A lot of its artistic production has been claimed by larger countries like Russia throughout its history. And these stories, stories like Stefania Turkevich's, are so vital. Ukraine has always had a rich, distinct, meaningful cultural tradition. Really? (laughs) And the fact that women were an important part of that is exciting. She also has five ballets and four symphonies and four operas and these larger works that have never been touched. So I was able to get in touch with Pavlo and his wife Larissa And Larissa was actually instrumental just a couple of years ago in going to um, the daughter of Stefania Turkevich's house and scanning all of her original autograph scores. And in the process of scanning all of those art songs, they thought, well, you know what, let's go ahead and scan all of her operas and symphonies and ballets in here too. And so when I reached out to them and and that I had a real interest specifically in Serce Aksani, which is probably her most successful opera, they said, oh, well, here's the score. And they sent me a Google Drive with her original manuscript. I mean, I was just floored. This is like every researcher's dream. (laughs) I mean, I can't even imagine. Yeah, I mean, that is every grad student's dream. That's the fantasy. (laughs) But if so much out there exists about her how come we haven't heard of her exactly that's the you know again the perennial question (laughs) on this podcast the answer is complicated Mm. 
But to understand it, we have to start at the beginning. Okay. Stefania Turkovic was born in 1898 in Lviv. During her lifetime, Galicia was part of the Austrian Empire, then Poland, then part of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic yeah. and the USSR. Mm -hmm. Her life sort of mirrors and, and walks alongside the rise of the USSR. And the USSR would have a profound and profoundly disruptive impact on her life mm. and her work. Her father and her grandfather were priests. Huh. Her mother is a gifted musician, a pianist, and her family is a very musical one. Everyone plays musical instruments. And Stefania herself as a child studied the piano, the harp, and the harmonium, Ooh. which is my favorite. If people aren't familiar with harmonium, it is a small organ and the player has to power the organ with her feet. You're powering the bellows that are pushing the air through the organ with your feet. Ah, bring it back. She was obviously gifted from a very early age and thankfully her family recognized her talent and encouraged it. Her early education was very cosmopolitan. She studied in Lviv, she studied in Prague. At 16, she goes to Vienna. Oh. So this is interesting collision of worlds, because if she's in Vienna, then this is the same time period as... Right, Alma Mahler. Right? Yeah. Maybe their paths crossed. And then, if she's in the USSR in the performing world, then she's crossing paths with Sahib <laughs> Gizatulina. And maybe they met. Yeah. I, I, that's so interesting to think yeah. of these worlds colliding like that. I've been trying to figure out if she met Alma Mahler because mm -hmm. they would have been in Vienna at the same time. But she's just at the beginning of uncovering this story. So okay. maybe something will turn up. She starts composing early when she's studying at the Lviv Conservatory. And as a teenager, she wrote a series of choral works commissioned for the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. She's studying composition wow. in Vienna and Prague along with performance. At 25, she moves to Berlin with her new husband, who is a painter. Mm. She had the opportunity to work in Berlin with a couple of names that musicians will know, Schoenberg and Schricker. And she definitely displays a lot of that expressionist influence in her music. But anyone listening to it will tell you that she's much more lyrical than Schoenberg tends to be and much more melodic. And she integrates hints at folk melodies. She doesn't always use direct folk melodies. She tries to evoke that kind of in the way that Dvorak often does in his music. And she's also influenced, obviously, by a lot of the Russian composers. It's just cool to find someone who was so clearly influenced by the major players of that era and who studied directly with people like Schoenberg. She was the first woman from Galicia to earn a PhD. Whoa! Like, the first first? The first of all women in Galicia to earn a PhD. She earns a PhD in musicology wow. in Prague in 1934. Stefania! By all measures, this is a brilliant, remarkable, noteworthy composer. Someone to watch. Absolutely. I don't like your tone, though. And then... Yep. Mm-hmm. A small historical event oh, intervenes in her career. Yes. The Russian Revolution. Uh -huh. <laughs> and as the formation of the USSR takes hold and takes over her country, mm -hmm. as Moscow starts dictating what can and cannot be created or performed or composed, uh -oh. what she's doing musically is suddenly not exciting and forward-looking and creatively brilliant. Uh, it's dangerous. Uh-oh. And finally, after World War II, her works are banned throughout the entire USSR. Wow. And again, I keep thinking of yeah. Sahib Gizitalina. How is she managing to keep this creative career going by shifting as 
as right. the rules change so that she can continue yeah. to make her art. Okay, you're not going to tell me that Stefania Turkovich was thrown into the gulag. Thankfully, no. Okay. She was chased out of Ukraine, essentially, because she refused to comply with socialist realism in her art. She saw the writing on the wall. And so she escaped to Italy and later to Ireland, ended up settling in the UK and lived her late years out in Cambridge, which is where she passed away. Erica Glenn believes that this is a large part of why her works are largely forgotten. Part of the reason I think that her story was buried is because she lived in so many different places and there are alternate spellings of her name in different languages. So even just digging up the pieces of this puzzle were problematized. Her story and her identity is scattered across several countries. Yeah, and plus, I mean, we're talking like active suppression in her own home country. Right. Yes, it is forbidden yeah. in her own land. And as she is moving across Europe, she is successful and popular. But it's hard to build a following when you are moving every few years and when you don't fit in. And her works in Ukrainian are very difficult to perform in places where few people and even fewer singers speak Ukrainian. Ah, uh, yeah. So they are never performed in Ukraine, uh, and it's difficult for them to be performed in the places where she's living. Yeah. Let's pause for just a second to thank our sponsor. Girls Can Crate is a unique subscription box inspiring girls to believe that they can be and do anything. Every crate features an inspiring woman, a 28-page activity book, plus everything you would need to complete two or three hands-on seam activities and more. And for our listeners, if you go to girlscancrate.com and use the code HERNAME, all caps, you'll get 20% off your first month's crate on any subscription. It's designed for kids, but honestly, I think it's fun for adults. I have had many moments of awe based on these subscription box for children. <laughs> Check them out now at girlscancrate, C-R-A-T-E dot com. And when you order, make sure you use the coupon code HERNAME, all caps, so that they know we sent you. Introducing the Every Podcast Series. Presented by UC Health, each episode tackles health and wellness issues and features female experts sharing insights to help you live your best life. Click here to listen and be well. One of Stefania Turkovich's most well-known operas is called The Heart of Oksana. One thing that excites me about this particular opera, Serce Aksani, is first of all, that it has such strong Ukrainian themes. And second of all, that it was produced by a team of women. Serce Aksani translates as the heart of Oksana, and it all centers on the story of this young girl and it pulls from a lot of elements of Ukrainian folklore as well. But it centers on the story of this young girl whose brothers wander off into the woods and get lost and she essentially has to go and save them. And she ends up being the only one with the power in the end to be able to save them. So there's this kind of implicit or maybe even explicit feminist theme that runs through the show in the very opening scene, which is in their family cottage. Oksana even explores her role as a woman and what that means in relation to the roles of her brothers. And it's all lighthearted, but just the way it's set up is so interesting to me. And this was written later in her life, obviously. It was 1969. But even, even in that period, in this area of the world, that would have made a really strong feminist statement. The project brought her back together with two former collaborators that she had worked with back in Lviv. Her sister Irina, who was a professional opera singer and a director, and uh, Daria Snikurovic, who was a prima ballerina. 
And so they had worked together when Stefania Turkevich was a very accomplished concert pianist and accompanist. And she worked as a, an accompanist at the Lviv Opera House. And that's where they all met originally. And then they went their separate ways. Her sister actually ended up out in Canada and founded a division of Prospita, which is an organization that promoted the work and the culture of Ukrainian artists and scholars. And so she, she headed up a division of that in Canada, wanted to put on a children's opera, and so reached out to her sister. And then they got Daria Smikhurovits involved, and it became an opera ballet. So it's this really interesting hybrid work that kind of defies genre. And then there are these long sections of the opera that suddenly morph into sheer ballet these entire 10 minute segments where nothing is happening but dance. So it premiered in 1969 in Manitoba. Huh. Two very positive reviews that called it original, powerful, bold. There's not a record of it ever being performed again. Hmm. But Erica Glenn was determined to bring this work back to life. Yes. For the first time in half a century. Ah. So, as part of her PhD, Erica Glenn staged the first U.S. production of this opera. Fantastic. It was a really beautiful experience for all of us working on this at ASU because several of the people involved either have Ukrainian heritage or some connection with Ukraine in that area of the world, or just felt strongly about helping to resurrect a female voice. And so this really was, you know, a, a passion project for us. It was something that I was doing not just because it was my dissertation, but because it genuinely felt important and tied together so many things that I feel strongly about. And all of the music in this episode is Stefania Turkovich's music provided to us by Erica Glenn. I brought in a good friend of mine, and this was an all-female team again. I brought in a good friend of mine who was in the dance program at ASU and she choreographed it all and I was working mostly with graduate vocal performance majors, opera majors, who, you know, are very, they have great facility with Italian and German and French and even Russian in some cases, but none of them had ever encountered Ukrainian before. <laughs> Several of them almost had panic attacks trying to grapple with the Ukrainian. And Erica Glenn thinks this opera in particular might be a crucial key for getting Turkovich's name back into circulation. It did make me realize that if we want this potentially to be used in the way that Humperdinck's Hansel and Gretel often is, as a tool for going into elementary schools and introducing opera, and you know maybe introducing them to a female composer they've never heard of, we really do need to have an English language version. And this is such a perfect fit for that because it's based in Ukrainian folklore. It has that fairy tale kind of a feel. There's a lot of fun music that's folk inspired. But like I said, it's also very sophisticated writing. I remember, of course, I remember <laughs> the first time the, an opera company came and performed a brief section <laughs> at an assembly for our school. Because your child heart just swelled with joy. <laughs> yes, it did. <laughs> but really, I mean, you say opera for children, and I think, is opera for children at all? Okay? Yes. It's three hours long. It goes on and on. It, you know what? I don't like opera. <gasps> there. I said it. How dare you? I do you? not like it. How I don't have to dare like you. it. <laughs> and you know what? The best one that I ever saw was in Prague, where they performed Don Giovanni with marionettes. And there were kids in there. They still didn't last the whole time, though, but they lasted longer. Uh, <laughs> that's the way to make opera interesting for kids. <laughs> but you know, I have not heard this one. I'll give it a chance. Maybe this is the opera that the world needs, that the world's children need. Well, that's very magnanimous of you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Heathen. Heathen. <laughs> <laughs>
Like, this is actually really exciting news because there, as you said, there are very few options for introducing children to opera. And as much as I love Hansel and Gretel, having played Gretel for children, too much acclaim. <laughs> it's great to have other options. And while this piece is a children's opera and it's shorter and it's more accessible and simpler than a lot of her work, I think it's a really good avatar for her work because it shows what she's doing. Her work is simple and complicated. It's melodic and unusual. It's doing a new thing. And while it shows a lot of clear influences from the people she studied with and the places she lived, it's entirely her own thing. And it's gorgeous. Stefania Turgovich's later biography is still very patchy. Much of her history is missing. There is one short Ukrainian language biography that exists by Stefania Pavlovshin. And I was able to get a copy of that that was mailed to me by Stefania Turkevich's daughter. And it focuses primarily, because it was published in Lviv, it focuses primarily on her early years in Lviv and doesn't delve at all really beyond touching on some of her, her compositions. It doesn't really delve into her life after that point. And unfortunately, the best source on that later history is gone. I was able to get in contact with her daughter who speaks English and Polish and Ukrainian. So we got in contact and were able to correspond back and forth in written form. And she remembers her mother working on this opera and has a lot of clear memories of her mother's most prolific compositional period, which was between like the 40s and 70s. And sadly, this daughter of hers passed away unexpectedly just a few weeks ago. So we were getting ready to have another interview where I was going to ask her very specific questions about her experiences. Sadly, that will never now come to fruition. Oh, no. But Erica Glenn is determined to uncover what there is. Yeah. And there has to be more. Oh, there has to be. I mean, yeah, this isn't shrouded in the mists of time. This is 20 years ago. Yeah. In fact, on the day we recorded this interview in 2020, ah. Erica Glenn had just learned that she had been awarded a Fulbright to spend a year in Ukraine and Eastern Europe researching, presenting, and performing Turkiewicz's work oh. and her life. Oh, my gosh. Oh, but... And then, yeah, of course, COVID. Mm. Yes. That trip didn't happen. Boo. But Erica Glenn is not one to be defeated, and I have no doubt that you will find a way to get back to Lviv somehow very soon. Absolutely. Anyway. What we do have of her work and her life and her history is largely due to her second husband, mm. who was a doctor and a part-time poet and understood the value and the importance of what Stefania Turkiewicz had created. You gotta have the champion. You have to have a champion. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, she married hers. Ah. But I, I do think it's very interesting, and it's something that I see coming up a lot, that women who whose work falls under the same umbrella, the, her husband or her brother, your Alma Mahler's, your Clara Schumann's. Yeah, your Caroline Herschel's. Yeah. Your Caroline Herschel's tend to get sidelined or end up yeah. being cast Absorbed. as competing with the men in their lives. Mm. Those men often seem to find it hard to champion these women in the uh. way that they might need. And mm -hmm. so thankfully... Neither of Stefania Turkovich's husbands were composers, and they were both, <laughs> it seems, extremely supportive, but especially her second husband, compiling, collecting, editing, preserving her scores, her music, and all of the manuscripts that Erica Glenn has been able to work from are due to his care and support of Stefania Turkovich's work. I wish we had access 
to her revised score. What happened in the process of producing this was she was working long distance with her sister in Canada and her sister would mail questions and suggestions to her and then she would mail a new score to her sister. So it was quite the process. It, it was a process that spanned several years probably. But we know that she went through several major revisions of the score. Sadly, none of those revisions have been preserved. So what I have is her original draft, and it would be really interesting to see what that final draft would have looked like. So those scores have to be out there somewhere. Yeah. Especially the Heart of Oksana, right, that is being mailed back and forth. So Canadians, right, check your attics, <laughs> see what you've got. These scores have to be around. They're somewhere. The reason that this episode has been delayed so long after the interview is that Erica Glenn and I were both hoping to be able to add more information as she found it in her Fulbright year. And obviously that didn't happen, but... But luckily um, now she's got the global listenership of what's her name behind her. Yes! Ukrainian fans, go find Stefania. Everybody, start looking. Exactly. So everybody start looking for Stefania Turkovich (laughs) information. Ukraine, Canada, England, Ireland. But also, this is just one part of Erica Glenn's work on bringing back female voices, women composers, these brilliant, talented women who have been overlooked for way too long. Uh, I think we've talked about this before, that I spend a lot of my time haunted by the knowledge that I'm never going to find my favorite things the book that would have been my favorite, (laughs) the composer that would be my favorite, I will likely never hear. So please, everyone, make it more likely that we can find our favorite composers (laughs) and start reclaiming these voices. You know, it keeps leading me new places, too. And I just feel so strongly about advocating for these women whose voices have been lost. It's sad on the one hand, but it's also exciting because it sets the stage for this wonderful rediscovery. And it sets the stage for resurrecting her entire lost history and work. It's pretty incredible. Huge thanks to Erica Glenn for her interview and for providing us with all of the music for this episode, which was all composed by Stefania Turkovich and performed at Arizona State University. For photos and more information, visit our website at whatshernamepodcast.com. There you can also find out how to become a patron of the podcast, where you can get all kinds of great thank yous like cross-stitch patterns, trading cards, even your own shout out in a future episode. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, where we post lots of photos each week. Our theme song was composed and performed by Daniel Foster Smith. What's Her Name is produced by Olivia Mickel and Katie Nelson, and this episode was edited by Olivia Mickel. Oh,